Okay, communities and ecosystems. So the interactions of their of species and the environment result in energy and nutrient flows. Um, so organisms will exchange uh, matter. You know, we're exchanging carbon dioxide and oxygen as we breathe right now. Um, we're also exchanging nutrients. Um, so we're consuming all those nutrients uh, and then we redeposit them into the environment as well. Um, photosynthesis and respiration play a huge role in the flow of energy. Um, so photosynthesis is taking that energy in the form of sunlight and turning it into um, matter, which we can actually use. Um, in this case, the matter is going to be glucose or sugars, which is why we like to eat plants because they're delicious. Um, and then respiration is sort of the, the opposite process where we're taking that glucose and we're turning it into energy um, that we can use to live and grow. Um, but a lot of that energy doesn't actually end up being used for growing. Most of it's being used for living. Um, and then we can look at feeding relationships in different ways using food chains or webs or ecological pyramids, uh, which we see here. And again, this is showing um, the both laws of thermodynamics actually. So the second law here is showing that at each level, we're actually decreasing in available energy because a lot of that energy is being lost as heat um, or lost as waste and fecal matter. Um, so there's the second law, right? The efficiency here is not gonna be 100%. Um, but we do see the first law of thermodynamics here too, right? The conservation of ener energy and matter. Because if you add up all this heat that's lost and all the waste that is lost, it should equal all the um, energy that actually came into the system. Um, so the total amount of energy here is gonna be the same. It's just that a lot of the energy becomes less useful um, as heat. Uh, so community is gonna be different species or different populations that um, live together in the same environment. We see a lot of different ungulates um, and also some elephants here. Those are odd toed ungulates. The rest of these are even toed with two toes. An ecosystem is gonna be the community and its physical environment as well. So both abiotic and biotic factors. Um, so, so kind of looking at, you know, not just um, the food chains and the food webs, but also um, the nutrients available to these plants, um, the, the weather and climate, etc. Um, so here's uh, again, the diagram for photosynthesis and respiration. Um, so you try to identify some inputs here. We have um, carbon dioxide coming into the plant and we have some water coming into the plant and then the plant is producing sugar and the plant is producing oxygen. Um, and then in the animals here, right, the input is gonna be some sugar and then the input is gonna be oxygen. And then the animals are um, producing water. We actually breathe out water, um, which is why sometimes you can actually see your breath if it's really cold. That's the water condensing into basically clouds or fog. Um, and then we also breathe out air, uh, carbon dioxide, of course. <clears throat> Um, so another visualization um, for photosynthesis, where you take CO2 and H2O to produce glucose and O2. Um, you don't have to remember the equation for this. If you just remember this as sugars or glucose, that's totally fine. Um, but it would be worth knowing CO2, definitely worth knowing H2O. And you might as well remember that O2 is actually the oxygen we breathe not just regular O, it's actually combined with another oxygen. Um, so you actually can see both equations here, right? So photosynthesis using these two to produce these two, and then respiration, the exact opposite. We breathe in oxygen and we use sugars to produce energy, ATP. This is the energy that we use to do actions. And then we also emit CO2 and H2O as well. Um, so that heat energy is, is sort of just wasted energy. And then we use that ATP to do work. Um, some of that work might actually go into building more materials, um, building more muscle, building more tissue, et cetera. Um, so primary producers are gonna be the ones that photosynthesize. These are also called autotrophs. Um, auto meaning automatic, you know, on their own, they make their own food. They're taking sunlight and turning it into glucose or sugars. Um, here's a balanced version of that equation. Again, you don't need to um, memorize the balanced version, um, but you should know these components here. 
carbon dioxide, water, oxygen, and glucose. So that glucose is how we produce our biomass. Maybe if you're in biology, you might have to know these differences, but we definitely don't need to know them in ESS. Um, so the trophic level is gonna be your position in the food chain. Um, what other organisms are you eating and what is eating you? Um, so the first level is gonna be those plants, those primary producers, since they're making all the food. Um, we're gonna have herbivores eating them and so on. Um, and since we're doing so much respiration, if you remember, heat is produced in that respiration. That's the second law of thermodynamics in action. So all of that um, energy that we're taking in, only about 10% actually goes into creating more body mass, creating more um, muscle, tissue, et cetera. And so losing energy at each trophic level. And so that's why they tend to look like a pyramid, right? smaller at the top, bigger on the bottom. Autotrophs make their own food, uh, though an interesting ex uh, exception um, are uh, deep sea, deep ocean vents. There's some chemosynthetic organisms, uh, chemo referring to chemicals. They actually make their food from chemicals coming out of the middle of the earth um, versus photosynthetic, right? Photo meaning light synthesis. <clears throat> Pretty interesting. Yep, so here's the, the deep sea chemosynthesis. Very rare, very uncommon. Um, part of the archaea uh, domain. Um, so here we can see a food chain. Uh, important to know the difference between a food chain and a food web and an ecological pyramid. A chain is going to be just like a regular chain, right? Just one link, a straight line. Um, we can't have multiple chains linked together um, because then we would start to make a web. So if it asks for a food chain, you have to draw only one organism at each level. Um, so here a nice difference, right? The food web is showing many different organisms at each level and actually lots of different connections. If it asks for a chain, you need just one path of energy. Um, and then again, energy pyramids or um, ecological pyramids are gonna show the same sort of relationships, but um, visualizing numbers or biomass, uh, etc. Biomass, um, numbers, or energy, um, or productivity, right? The change in biomass over time is going to be the big difference there. Um, and of course, second law of thermodynamics we see directly in, in pyramids of biomass and pyramids of energy, pyramids of productivity tends to decrease <clears throat> as you go up the food chain. Um, and we also see that with numbers, right? There's way less bald eagles um, than there are like mice and warblers and, and uh, things like that, because there's not really enough energy to support that many. So much energy is just lost through respiration. Um, so bioaccumulation, very important concept. So this is uh, happens with non-biodegradable pollutants. They're building up in organisms over time. Um, so the, they'll actually accumulate. Accumulate means to grow. Um, and then as um, those, um, they're, as they're eaten, they'll actually increase uh, as you go up the trophic level. So there's a subtle difference here. Bioaccumulation is just happening within a single organism. Um, so if I'm eating, say, a lot of fish, maybe I'm getting mercury from there, and that mercury will stay in my body. So that's accumulating. Um, biomagnification is going to be between trophic levels. Um, so again, here we see on the top uh, in this same individual, as this fish lives, it gains a higher concentration. Um, whereas in biomagnification, since each level has to eat uh, multiple individuals of the level below it, the, the concentration of the pollutant actually increases. So this is why DDT was so damaging to the top predators, because the concentration increased so much. And we can see that here, right? We have really low levels and then the concentration of DDT actually increases. And this way it's kind of the opposite of a normal pyramid, right? So usually we have like um, smaller at the top, larger at the bottom. Um, and here it's kind of the opposite where the pollutant actually is magnified at the bottom because there's so few individuals for it to exist in, right? You can imagine there's the same amount of pollution here and then the same amount of pollution here in a smaller space same amount of pollution here in a smaller space, et cetera. And so that's biomagnification. Seems like it's a higher concentration. 
And so it really affects the top of the food chain. Um, so pyramids of numbers can kind of depend on um, when you're looking at it. So if you look at a pyramid of numbers in the winter versus in the spring, it might get total different results. And then so it can kind of create like an inverted pyramid where it might look like um, it's actually larger on the top um, or like a lot of species just surviving on one tree, uh, which is why biomass is more helpful and really why productivity is the best of all. Because um, with biomass, we could, it really depends on the time of year too, right? Since it's just the stock at a specific time, um, it could depend on when you actually measured that biomass. Was it a good year for snowshoe hares? Was it a good year for red foxes? That could, that could affect what you see. Um, as we see here, right? So uh, in the summer versus in the autumn when there's less producers, um, but still probably a lot of um, consumers. Uh, the productivity are kind of the most ideal because um, they're uh, taking into account that time, the seasonality, um, since they look over an entire year. Um, and you can see productivity as kilojoules, uh, which is energy, or sometimes kilocalories too. Um, calories is actually a measure of energy, which is why you look at calories on your food. Um, or you could actually look at um, this as biomass over time, um, since that's also showing productivity um, just in a different way. Um, so productivity is always going to decrease because we took away all the other factors um, related to seasonality, etc. Um, so this is kind of the most pure form uh, where we can really see how energy is transferred. And we really actually can see how much energy is lost at each level here too, right? You could probably calculate um, the amount of energy lost at each level and then calculate the efficiency. You know, they say 10% rule, but if you do the calculations here, you'll find out it's some of them are not quite 10%, a little bit more, a little bit less. Some, some example style questions, construct food chains, food webs, ecological pyramids from given data. Um, explain the transfer and transformation of energy as it flows through ecosystems. Analyze the efficiency of energy transfers. So um, how, what percentage of energy is actually getting passed on to the next level. Construct systems diagrams for photosynthesis and respiration. Uh, remember you need to know oxygen, glucose and carbon dioxide and water and how they go in and how they come out. Explain the laws of thermodynamics and how they relate to the flows of energy. So the second law here, all of this heat being lost um, but the first law would say that the total amount of energy is going to be the same. Um, and then explain the impact of persistent or non-biodegradable pollutants, how they accumulate in an organism and then they magnify as they get passed on to each level. And once again, you can find links to this slideshow in the description.